In our biblical theology class or series right now, if you'll remember, we're still in what we call the prolegomena or the first things, the introductory period. We're not even going into themes yet. We're kind of introducing biblical theology. And we've already gone through um, an introduction, just introducing the term biblical theology, where it, what it means, where it finds itself in a theological system and interpretation. Uh, we looked at a hermeneutic more closely. Uh, for example, the scope of Scripture being Christ, that principle in, helps guide our interpretation of Scripture. We also... Um, looked in 1 Peter 1, and we saw how uh, the prophets themselves knew of Christ. They were hoping in Him and looking into their own predictions about the time and what would become uh, from them. Now we're moving into a little bit more specific part of our introduction to biblical theology, and it's, we titled it Symbolism, more specifically Imagery Typology Patterns. And what this is or where it is in our introduction is it's a specific category of hermeneutics. Specific category. So we kind of talked about hermeneutics, promise and fulfillment hermeneutic before, and that's more broadly. But now we're kind of targeting an area of hermeneutics. And there's a lot of areas. You know, we could look at uh, uh, grammar like we've been doing on uh, small group. We could look at how to do historical analysis from context, things like that. So why are we focusing on symbolism this morning and next week? Uh, because in this area of symbolism, particularly typology, there is the, the greatest difference that exists among orthodoxy. There's the greatest amount of ignorance uh, among those trying to handle the Bible in a biblical theological way, seeing the history of redemption. So in this area, it's like where historically, and I think among us as well, where we're the weakest. Uh, And I want us, Lord willing, through the two weeks that we have, it's very short, to grow in this area to have a better hermeneutic in dealing with imagery in the Bible, symbols in the Bible, dealing with types and anti-types, dealing with patterns that exist, like creation, new creation. There's this, what happens with Noah, for example? Why is the commission given to Noah sounding so similar to what he gave to Adam? Is that a pattern? And should I see that pattern? Should I be anticipating? anticipating to see that pattern again, and then we see it again in Christ. So uh, identifying patterns, and particularly typology, will equip you by a humble receiving and implementation of this hermeneutic to more consistently interpret the Bible. That's what we're after. We're, we're not going to arrive at a perfect interpretation of all of Scripture while we remain in the flesh. Uh, But we're laboring from Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit, having a new heart and a new mind, to interpret the Bible in a way that is most consistent with itself, both in its parts and its whole. A hermeneutic and an interpretation of Scripture that can uh, more comprehensively interpret and explain what the Bible means and its parts, and its whole than any other system. We're laboring to apply the interpretation that is most consistent and is most comprehensive in dealing with the Bible. We're not satisfied with a system where we recognize these huge gaps, and we can't possibly hurdle those gaps or fill them in with the current hermeneutical system that we have. We're going to labor to see, well, is there anything else in the Scripture that will fill those gaps in? And when we discover, we're going to grow in those areas and see if those new ways or not new per se in history, but perhaps new to some of us, uh, is more consistent with some former nuance that we had in our interpretation. So typology is an area where we historically were over here, and we've taken some steps 
And we've grown, and now we're able to explain more of the Bible. And understand, and, and all this leads to edification, which in joy of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, in a deepening understanding of the Lord deepens our communion. And through us, we are glorifying God in ways uh, through its communication of the gospel or just living it out, ways that we formerly were not because of our informed communion with God. So that's the goal. All right, uh, James Hamilton says, if we want to understand the Bible, we have to consider what symbols stand for, what story they're telling, and how, they, how they're interpreting and summarizing what has gone before as they point to what is and will be. So symbolism as a whole is where we're at first. And a definition, which is very simple, is symbolism is the communication of meaning uh, through the use of figurative or symbolic language as opposed to explicit non-symbolic language. Um, if I said, can you give me a hand, that hand is symbolic. But if I say, can you help me, I'm saying, help me. But it, I have actually said the same thing. It's just I chose to use the symbol of a hand to tell you what I want. Um, and because you're used to hearing the word hand get used in that way because... Uh, of the context and perhaps it was used, you would immediately know what that symbol meant and would not think about your physical hand and how to give that to somebody. So, communication of meaning through the use of figurative or symbolic language. And it occurs on multiple levels in the Bible. Um, the function of symbolism in the Bible, and these are simple introductory descriptions. Symbolism is used to summarize and reinforce concepts. So a symbol like the tree of life was the tree of life. We evangelized somebody yesterday and he denied that the garden was ever on earth. But it was. It was created in a, uh, and God created the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and there was literal fruit on there that they were forbidden to eat. But that tree of life though it was a real tree, was also a symbol, a representation of a great, of a, of a truth, of eternal life. We see that picked up in that symbol now getting its fuller meaning in Revelation. It's not the same tree in Revelation that was there. That was a literal tree. Over in Revelation, it's figurative. But over here in Genesis, there's this uh, figurative sense where it's already... Uh, by giving it, by the name of it being called the tree of life, given symbolism and some meaning in that context. So, um, but tree of life can summarize a lot of truth. What is eternal life and glory? Eternal life is a lot of things, it's more than justification and forgiveness of sins, it's more than regeneration and a new heart. It's being fully and finally sanctified, made perfect. It's being in union with Christ. It's having a never, not just having a never dying soul, having a never dying body. It's not even just that. It's more than that. It's in a body and soul, not only in perfection and in holiness and in uh, you know, ethic, but also in uh, the composition of it, the health of it, uh, the relation that we will have in body and soul to God in Christ's union, uh, in union with Christ. So eternal life uh, in its consummation will look like glory. And we can summarize that all in one symbol, tree of life. So a symbol has the ability when rightly interpreted to summarize a lot of things. So symbol has uh, ability. And I know we need to be careful with what we identify and associate with our symbols. 
So I'm not saying just go unrestrained, but I'm just talking about the principle that a symbol can represent uh, uh, multiple things in a summary way. And reinforce concepts, and also summarize and reinforce the biblical story or redemptive history, special revelation. It's also used to interpret through repetition. So when you see symbols repeating, or imagery repeating, or typology repeating, or like patterns, uh, it helps to interpret through that repetition. The repetition having occurred in the Bible and going back to the original context, seeing what it uh, meant for that context, but then seeing it repeated like with Noah, you see that pattern you don't just think, oh, God made a covenant. You think new creation. Oh, judgment looks like decreation or destruction of creation. Look at, you know, so, and those patterns help, help you interpret what came before and what came after. So, um, that's the function of symbolism in the Bible in a simple way. The different kinds of symbolism in the Bible. So what are some different kinds of symbolism? And I'm using this term broadly. Broadly. Well, first of all, in a simple way, it can reference just figures of speech. Like, I, uh, that was a figure of speech earlier. You know, can you give me a hand? That, the hand itself is a symbol, uh, which is a specific form of a figure of speech. Um, but figures of speech in the Bible, there's all kinds in, in language. There's a metaphor. If you turn to Luke 13, 32. Herod wants to kill you. The Pharisees came to Jesus and told him that in 31. And in 32, he says, go tell that fox. Tell that fox. He's not literally a fox. He's figuratively a fox. So there's something about the nature and the way a fox behaves that gives meaning to the association with Herod. So Herod, in some way, is like a fox. But he doesn't say, go tell him who is like a fox. That's like a simile where it says like. He just says, go tell that fox. His metaphor is even stronger. It puts the image more in front. It doesn't even take the, the man and put him up here next to it with like. It just puts him behind, a little bit more behind, and says fox to, to reinforce whatever the fox import is. And in this case, sly, clever. Perhaps more. I'm not propose, supposing that I know all of what he meant uh, right here and now. I haven't studied that well, but... You see the point is there's a figure of speech there, and it's called a metaphor. Another one is Acts 27, a synecdoche. Acts 27, and it won't jump out at you right away because I think a lot of our English interpretations already translate it for us rightly. And in all, we were 267 persons on the ship. The narrative section in Acts, prose. And where's the synecdoche and what is a synecdoche? Well, that, that word persons, actually, literally in the Greek, it's sukai, which means souls. So you could have translated that in all and in all, we were 267 souls on the ship. Man is composed of more than a soul. He is body and soul. And these two are in union. Well, why would Luke use the word soul to speak of entire people? Because everybody who reads it would know he's referencing these people. But he only used the word of their immaterial part of who they are. So what does synecdoche mean? It's a figure speech in which a part is used to describe the whole. So in this case, the word soul, which is part of a man, is used to describe the whole of a man. Here's another expression we use in our own language for synecdoche. 
um, can you give me some bread, sir? I don't mean, we don't say that a lot, but they might not actually mean bread. They might just mean food. Um, somebody might say, you know, I think this is an older expression, like referencing pennies, but not saying, can I have pennies? Can I have some copper? Where you're really, you're talking about what a penny is made up of. I don't think our pennies are made up of copper anymore. I don't know, but you would say the material which is made out of or originally was made out of. And what you mean is the whole coin. A part for the whole. But people know that figure of speech. They might not know what it's called and how to define that figure of speech. They just know what's happening. Oh, he just, uh, or some, I heard a brother say this, nice wheels. You know, like. No, nice car. But the wheels are a part of that car, and we use that synecdoche to reference the whole car, part for the whole. So those are, those are forms of symbolism in the Bible. They're figures of speech, simple figures of speech. A longer extended figure of speech, if you want to call it this, is, might be a parable. How, do you, how would you categorize a parable? Um, some people don't call it, they call it an analogy, but... You know, figures of speech are analogous. Next, symbols and imagery. So right here, this is where we're at now. It includes symbols. And if you go to uh, point two, I'll just jump right into symbols on point two. And we'll work down now through the rest of this outline. So a definition of a symbol is right up underneath that phrase. It's a sign which communicates meaning rather than explicitly stating it. It's pretty simple, right? A sign which communicates some meaning in association with whatever it's tied to without explicitly saying what it's signifying about that. So the symbol, when someone uses a symbol, like when I talk about give me a hand, and I guess I, could, I should move to another use uh, because we already talked about hand under figures of speech. But it is a figure of speech, but the word hand itself is a symbol. So, or I'll, I'll use the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion is a symbol. What's a, a lion a symbol for? typically in the Bible. Like, why would the Bible use the word he is like a lion prowling, like a prowling lion? You know, what, why the figure speak, or the symbol of a lion being used? What does that communicate? Dr. Carl? Strength. Strength. Confidence. 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 Ability. Power. Dominance. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so when you use a symbol, when the Bible uses a symbol to reference something, to communicate uh, a truth about something, or communicate a concept to someone, that symbol of itself, like a lion, is a literal thing. So you're, you are supposed to know what a lion is literally, But the symbol conveys some concept or truth that's not the literal object itself. And how do we know what it's communicating about what that sign or symbol is referencing? The proper interpretation of a symbol's meaning depends on knowing the connection between the symbol and the truth it represents. So you have to know the connection between that symbol and what truth is being communicated. How would we know that the lion of the tribe of Judah is communicating to us strength, power, dominance when it comes to Christ? How do we know, you know, uh, it's communicating that? Where, Where are we getting those connections from? Tyler. You could say, um, 
just from what we see in lions, but you could also say from the Bible itself in places like um, uh, Genesis 49, where it says that he's a, uh, a lion's whelp and he, um, and he devours, and I don't remember all the language that's used there, but it's a prophecy of the lion of the tribe of Judah um, who basically um, has power and dominion. Amen. Amen. So this one's really simple because, you know, lions commonly get used to, it's, it's more common to us, more familiar even to us all the way this many generations later. But if something seems a little bit more cryptic to you personally when you see a symbol in the Bible uh, and the connections aren't as clear, some ways to help you make those connections is one, know the context. Uh, understand the culture, the people and how they would have understood that, the author and what he was communicating about. And also being familiar with Scripture and its use of that symbol in general. So one of the things that lends itself to having a problem with interpreting symbols is ignorance of Scripture. Ignorance of context. Uh, that's not the only thing. It, it's largely also dependent on your presuppositions about the way in which God communicates. So if you have a presupposition and you have, maybe you have something that, um, that will not allow you because of a presuppositional position to think of it that way, it's, it's going to be something that will be an impasse for you. So um, there's no silver bullet there on how to make the connections between symbols and what truth they're conveying in all cases, but we're giving you a principle is context, not just the immediate and knowing the culture and background, but also the authorial intent and what he's laboring to do, and then that use of that symbol in Scripture itself. So let's look at an example. Go to Amos 8. And instead of reading all of 1 through 12, I'm just going to read a few verses here, starting at 1. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore, and the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many bodies everywhere, they shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed, that we may sell grain and the Sabbath, that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like a river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. And he keeps going. So he's, bring, he's getting ready from that prophecy based on their sins of the way they're treating the poor and the needy of the land to bring judgment on them. And Amos is prophesying. But before he even gets into his prophecy, God gave him a vision of what? It says there in one, a basket of summer fruit. What does that mean? So there's a symbol in the Bible. And we have some of the context. It's coming in the vision of a prophet. And that vision uh, from which he prophesies judgment we have context. So what did a basket of fruit mean in the summer to an agricultural co uh, community like Israel? I want to read this to you. The Lord show, showed Amos a basket of summer fruit, 
He asked him what he saw. The prophet replied, a basket of summer fruit. Next the Lord answered, The end has come unto my people. I will proceed no longer to overlook them. In this section, there is a play on two similar sounding Hebrew words, uh, kayets and kets, summer fruit and end. This is an understandable symbol, summer fruit that is, among an agricultural people. A ripe basket of fruit, so in the summer, a ripe basket of fruit for an agricultural people. At the close of summer is either consumed, it's not stored, it's consumed for, by eating, or if it's left uneaten, it's consumed by spoiling. So a basket of fruit at the end of summer, it's, it's going away. It's, it's end is about to end, whether people are going to eat it right then and there or it's just going to spoil. Just as the basket of fruit speedily comes to its end, so the Lord will bring his people Israel to the end which he has appointed for them. He will no longer overlook their sin. He will act in judgment. This is a vivid symbol. So you can see a, a symbol there, or uh, you could say imagery, but a symbol more clearly in a vision given to Amos. Any questions about that? Okay. Tyler. Uh, back here. Just, uh, just thinking about how um, this is helpful because we have a tendency to take these concepts and thinking as if we invade those things and we're trying to go back in the Bible and impose them, whereas the concept of imagery and patterns, those things originate in the Bible and probably that's why language today is how it is. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's yeah. helpful to see that. Yeah, yeah, amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's look at the number 12. Let's go to a numerical symbol. So I'm just going to show you 12 existing in the Bible in certain contexts and then go towards Revelation and show it used in the visionary, uh, the visions of John and then uh, read uh, a little bit of what Mickelson is showing from that. Because it, it finds itself running through Scripture. So Exodus 24... Verse 4. Ten commandments have been given. Israel affirms the covenant. And I'm going to start in one. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told all the people the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord had said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. So Moses is erecting these pillars in association with the tribes of Israel. Twelve pillars, twelve tribes. Where did the 12 tribes of Israel came, come from? Yeah, it was the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, so these 12 sons were given by the Lord. The Lord determined the tribes based off of him giving progeny in a number 12. So he determined that number, and it's associated with the people of God in the context, these tribes of Israel. Um, and here, Moses, uh, in line with that number, is erecting 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes. So let's keep going. Matthew 10.
says, And when he called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the name of the twelve apostles are these. And if you will remember in the Gospels, Jesus prayed in preparation for the uh, uh, identifying of the commissioning of these 12 men. Uh, It's not coincidental, haphazard. It was Jesus Christ, the mediator, choosing 12 uh, in accordance with God's will, having prayed. Uh, And now let's keep going. Revelation 7. If you remember too in Acts... Before, this is before the Apostle Paul, who was born out of, out of due time. But if you remember in Acts, after Judas fell, Peter knew our number is incomplete. Let's cast lots to comp- keep, continue to keep the number of the disciples at 12. Uh, Revelation 7. Verse 4, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then you have the tribes there, but in each tribe there's 12,000. Not 1,000, not 7,000, 12,000. And that's how we arrive at the 144,000. Now, if you keep going, look at 21. Twelve. This is a description of the new Jerusalem. And she had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, three in all different directions. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Look at 22, 2. And I'll start in one, though. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each yielding to its fruit every month. So in Revelation, which is highly symbolic, it's visions, symbols given in visions, Um, we can see this repetition in the New Jerusalem of 12 gates, 12 foundations. And then when we are uh, given the vision of the garden or the tree of life, the tree of life in the new heavens and new earth in this text has 12 fruits. So what you see there is this repetition beginning with the 12 tribes of Israel all the way from Exodus picking up again with the Lord's commissioning of 12 disciples, them continuing that number at Pentecost or just before, and then Revelation, which is the consummation of all things and highly symbolic, we see a lot of reference to this number 12 in association with the New Jerusalem. So let me read to you uh, Ringsdorf. If the language is of a ceiling of 12,000 out of the 12 tribes, there is asserted by this that the number of those sealed is determined through the counsel of God and that the community is built out of them, that the community built out of them bears the characteristic of absolute completeness. Further, indeed, that this community, the church, is to be of a vast magnitude The expression, the twelve, is useful for the stress on the divine will, what at the same time is always a redemptive will and is revealed also here as a redemptive will. 
the expression, the thousands, is useful for calling attention to the magnitude of the church the uni- or this community. The uniform o- origin of the 12,000 out of the individual tribes is useful for recognition of the regularity of the divine action and of the completion, the completeness of its results. The attestation to the absolute unity of the sealed ones is their concentration in the number 144,000. The whole is nothing other than the resolute and confident acknowledgement of God as the Lord of his community. And here in parentheses, church, who attains his goal in it with its, within its history. Uh, any other interpretation necessarily leads the wrong way. But I wanted you to hear uh, this interpretation. I wanted you to see this pattern, this repetition, heavily occurring when it comes to the people of God. Uh, uh, Okay, one second. So we see it with the children of Israel and the tribes, which are the people of God. And then we see it with the disciples, which are the people of God, and then we see it in the New Jerusalem. So, yes, sir. Hey, good morning. Um, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. The, the, 12, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel in Exodus, which we saw, and the 12 disciples in Matthew are literal twelves. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Then when we come to Revelation, the the 12 foundations um, of the wall and the 12 gates and the tree of life here in verse two, in chapter 22 and the and the and the 12 fruits uh, being born from that tree i heard you say are symbolic is that correct am yes. i correct in saying that yes where do, you, where do you understand those to be symbolic? That is the tree of life here in Revelation 22, mm-hmm. where John is shown a vision. He showed, me a tr- uh, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of, the, of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves are for the healing of the nation, and, and, the, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Where do you, from that, come up and um, come up with the understanding that that is symbolic, and and likewise also with chapter twenty one, with the with the new Jerusalem that came down from the, from heaven, and the twelve gates, and the and the the twelve foundations. Where do you understand from that 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 is symbolic? Because you've drawn that's a, us. That's a good question. Um, I, so I want to answer your question and probably won't, uh, not, not out of any disrespect, but, um, out of, uh, acknowledging my own weakness, you know? Um, but my point isn't so much as to get into whether or not, uh, Revelation 21 or 22 and those structures uh, those trees in that river is symbolic or literal. It's to uh, show how that number 12 isn't, um, uh, it, it is symbolic of more than just a number. Like the number itself, whether it be used in reference to something literal in the Bible, like the children of Israel or the disciples or whether it's referenced in a literal new heavens and new earth described this way, or a symbolic new heavens and new earth described this way, the point I wanted to make is that the number 12 itself as a number is symbolic of a truth instead of just um, uh, uh, an arbitrary or consistent number. Um, but to answer your question, where do I know that that's symbolic? Uh, I think it would get into the, the hermeneutic and the, the book as a whole, like uh, how I'm going to come at this and what kind of a genre. At what points will I see it as literal? At what points will I see it symbolic? And what hermeneutics are leading me to that? So 
I'm not uh, taking a dogmatic stance on that aspect so that I'm going to argue for that uh, interpretation at this point. I think um, leaving it unaddressed and open uh, is, uh, is appropriate given where my preparation is. But also, I can point us to Pastor Mark's preaching because I think when he gets there, there'll be time where he's going to get into, and we'll probably get to things that may or may not by some be seen as literal or symbolic. Early on, we don't even have to wait till this part of Revelation to start addressing some of the nature of questions like that. So... um, Kind of like two, you know, with numbers, uh, the number seven is symbolic. Uh, you see that number get used a lot in the Bible, uh, speaking of perfection. Um, and it's, an, it's wanting you to see that there are, there's sig- significance beyond just a numerical count that's consistent with that number. Because that numbers can get used in ways that are communicating something of themselves. Uh, They might not even be completing a a whole statement, but because that number was used, it's communicating something about the content in which it was used. So that was my goal, and I'm sorry I can't go into it more. Thank you for your question. Uh, But let's go to typology. Yeah. So I put there on the handout to be continued in part two. All I, I, uh, that's the area I told you where I think we can grow the most. Just from what I, I know, I'm not, I don't know everything where everybody's at, <laughs> but from what I know about where we are and where we've been, things like that, I know typology is very important, very uh, descriptive of where those differences are really lying. Um, <clears throat> so that's why we're going to spend all of next week on it. And I'm just going to kind of introduce it here, and we're just going to hit hard on typology next week. So I, this is a G.K. Beale's definition. It's picked up by other Reformed Baptists today, like Samuel Renahan um, and... Uh, it contains these elements that make up typology, and these elements that are underlined in that definition, you'll see them uh, almost widespread in um, Reformed doctrines of grace writers. When they're try- it doesn't matter if they're dispensational or not. You're going to see these elements described in their typology definitions. But I like... Uh, G.K. Beale's definition because um, it's using very precise words and also is succinct, trying to get all those elements into one definition. So let's read it. Typology is the study of analogical correspondences among revealed truths about persons, events, institutions, and other things within the historical framework of God's special revelation, which from a retrospective view are of a prophetic nature and are escalated in their meaning. So first of all, there's analogical correspondences. And I'm going to get into this at at more depth next time. I'm not going to write it because I already, I just remembered how much time we've got. Um, let's look at, so analogical, analogy. You, you compare one thing, you make an analogy of something else, and it's corresponding to something. Uh, retrospective, so when do we see these correspondences and what helps us to uh, see them clearly? It's, it's retrospectively, meaning looking backwards. Also, it's an identification that, even though they're recognized at once being looked at backwards, that what came before 
was prophetic in the fulfillment of the, um, the antitype. And what came before compared to what came after in this type is that the part that came after is higher in meaning, more escalated. I want to just introduce you to the word uh, tupos, and it comes out in our transliteration, typos. But uh, go to John 20, and I'm just going to show you this Greek word. It's not even getting used in the sense that we're meaning it when we say typology and hermeneutics. I just want to show you how the Greek word occurs in the Bible. 2025. And the second part. So he said to, to them, unless I see in his hands the print, that's tupos or typos. So we could call this printology, I guess. I'm just kidding. But what you can see is it's not the nail that they're looking at. They're looking at the imprint that the nail made, the scar. What determined the shape of that scar? The nail itself. But the scar is not the nail. But they are related. So when you show someone the scar, they think of the nail. And the nature of those two things are different, but they're related through analogy. Uh, over here, we got a quick question. Go ahead, Sean. I'll just repeat it. Gets back into the 12 and 24. I mean, sorry, when we were talking about the number 12. Yeah. Um, in verse 24, um, now Thomas called the twin one of the 12. Um, I think if you, if you look in a dictionary of biblical imagery, 12 gets associated with so many things that the 12 then takes on a symbolic meaning because of that association. Like here, 12 now, you start thinking of the apostles when you say the number 12. So I'm just, would you agree with that? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Kind of came back to that. Thank you, brother. Um, let's go to Acts 7.43 and see this word tupos or typos. And it's used somewhere else. You also took up the tabernacle, or tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Rimphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Tupos here is the word images. Images. So when you make it, you craft an image, you're crafting it after some kind of idea. So the image itself isn't the idea or the false god that you imagine. It's an image of the false god. It's a type, a pattern, a print of it. So that word type is just meaning print, example, pattern, a copy. And you could go look at those other references and they'll jump right out of you. Another one is we have many types among us. This is a different use. And what that is in the Bible is used as examples. What are, we, what are they examples of? Of Jesus Christ. So in that sense, no, it's not biblically prophetic and it's not the typology definition that we're using for hermeneutics. You can just see that word tupos getting used like in 1 Thessalonians 1 or you became an example um, to others. That's also the word type. And I was going to use Adam. Uh, we need to shorten it up and I need to end uh, right after I say this so uh, I was going to use Adam if you'll go look at him in Romans 5 14 the word type is there it calls him a type and it uses that same word tupos um, <clears throat> and that's actually the meaning of tupos that we want to define and grow in is when the apostle Paul uses the word that I, that Adam was a type of him who was to come. What did he mean when he said he was a type? And it's this definition. It's saying that Adam, by God's design, was made to be an analogical correspondence to Jesus Christ. That 
it would be better understood after Christ came that that's what Adam's function or one of his roles was. And that Adam of himself had a prophetic nature being patterned after Christ in a certain way. And that Adam was the lesser of the two. He was telling you something about Christ to come by being patterned after Christ. But Christ is, is escalated or the greater meaning in that relationship. So, and then if you want to look at patterns, uh, we didn't, I'm sorry we didn't have time for that. Uh, but there's a healthy or a useful observation about patterns existing within the feast and the righteous sufferer which began in Genesis 3.15, but we see just carried on through Abel and uh, uh, on into Joseph and on into Isaiah, and there's this running pattern of a righteous sufferer that is fulfilled in Christ. And when you know, when you're familiar with this pattern, you're able to better handle an immediate text knowing that pattern has been repeated in other places. So uh, let's close there and thank you all let's pray gracious father thank you for your word we recognize lord that uh, we uh, are in absolute need of you uh, that we would not know you had you not revealed yourself and your son by the spirit given us uh, a new heart and renewed our mind to have even a desire to rightly interpret your word, and we praise you for these desires. I pray that you would help us as a church to um, fear you, that we might tremble at your word. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be careful in our interpretation and whatever principles we pick up. I pray, Lord, that you would guide us into an interpretation and a hermeneutic that is most consistent with your word as we fight sin and that can most comprehensively in the flesh understand it. Uh, I pray these things that you might be glorified in in this body uh, and that we uh, might communicate your gospel as clear uh, as able. Amen.